Good afternoon and welcome to another virtual event at the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. I'm John Charles and I'm delighted to have with us today one of my very favorite authors in the world, Jane Ann Krentz, who today is visiting us as her alter ego, Amanda Quick. Welcome, Jane and Amanda. <laughs> Thank you and thanks for having both of us here. We're having a great time. Um, you're here to, to uh, talk about your new Amanda Quick book, The Lady Has a Past. Uh, but before we delve into what's new with you, let's take a trip to the past. Tell us a little bit about yourself and who you were before you became the literary icon you are today. Well, I'm still waiting to become a literary icon. That's, that's off in the future, hopefully, <laughs> one of these days. Um, but to your point, I have had a couple of other careers before I got this writing gig. Um, two of which I learned an enormous amount from. The first was being a waitress. I think everybody should be in food and beverage at some point in their lives. Um, it, it's a learning experience like no other. And the other learning experience was being a librarian. And uh, between the two, I couldn't have found two better setups for becoming a writer. I just, I, it's worked but worked out well. Um, is the waitress because it introduced you to so many different people? It gave you kind of a, a view at? Yeah, and you're viewing them from a perspective that they don't know you're viewing them because they don't pay that much attention to you. You're not a member of their dining party. You're not at the table. You're just the person bringing the food. So you're watching them and it's like they don't even know you're there. Uh -huh. <laughs> So it's, it's kind of a cool experience for a, for a writer. Practice for writing. Um, and librarianship because it taught you about research or what did that? In, in one sense, that was the, the single most important thing I learned was research and the difference between things like primary sources and secondary and thirdary <laughs> sources. I mean, that everybody should have that lesson too, regardless. But for librarians, as you know, um, that's just part of the education that we get going in and we never forget it. So it's been very useful to me in the writing, especially with, especially with the historicals. Um, it, it's just, it's given me a sense of what I can trust about the past and what I, you know, what I read about the past and what I shouldn't be trusting. So. And eventually you decided you wanted to become a writer. So what was that path to publication? like? Was it uh, overnight success? Yeah, right. Six years. <laughs> <laughs> like six years. It's all a blur. Um, well, first of all, I think people become right. I, I became a writer, I should say, because I was a reader first. And there just came a time when I wanted to tell my story my way. It wasn't that I thought I could do it better than anybody else. And, but I, I just, it, there, there just came a time when it was I wanted to do it my way. I wanted to have the characters talk to each other the way I wanted them to talk. So it became that, that experience of, of just trying to see, see what it felt like to actually try to write a book. And then it became addictive. Uh, when I was working as a librarian, I was getting up at 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning and writing, you know, until it was time to leave for work. So it was... An, an obsession that I couldn't quit. I don't know how many times I told myself I quit because it couldn't get published. In those days, there was not the option of self-publishing. So it was New York or bus. And New York was a hard door to crack open. So as every writer who's ever tried that knows. But eventually, uh, what really turned in my favor was the market. Okay. Yeah, the market for the American style romance just kicked in big in the 80s and 90s. And I was standing on the right street corner at the right time when the car went, bus went by. Now, when you were starting out as a writer, you adopted a lot of different pseudonyms. Was that by choice, by design, by, talk to us about writing under different names. It's a real pain. Um, I do not recommend it, especially these days with social media being such a demanding way, a time sink for writers. You do not want to be, trying to promote two or three different names. Trust me on this, people, if you're out there thinking of writing. 
And no, the excuse that you're changing genres is not good enough. That's not a good enough reason to try different names. I wound up with multiple names, not because I wanted them, but because at the time I was getting started up in the business, it was not uncommon for publishers to um, hand you a contract that basically gave them exclusive use to your name as the author. So if you changed publishers, and at the time there were a dozen publishers, there were plenty of places to go, you couldn't take your name with you if you were dumb enough to sign the contract, which I did. And that is, so it was more like the legal side of things. It was more like the contractual side of things that explains how I ended up with multiple names. But there were a couple of times when I changed them because I had, I, I had sold so badly under one name <laughs> that I, I didn't want that name anymore. It was too much baggage out there in the sales world. So um, that's how I got the Amanda Quick name. Oh. I had killed off my Jane Ann Krentz career at the time. It looked better than a doornail and no, but no publisher would touch Krentz. And the reason it got killed, I killed it off was because uh, of the futuristics. I, what I now write, I do write those under Jane Castle now, and it's probably that is the one exception I would say that I should stick with. But um, then I fired up the Amanda Quick name so I could start fresh with no sales baggage. And the publisher at the house I had left decided that, well, if, if my new publisher could make me work, maybe they could too. And so, <laughs> so they got back in the game. Again. And all of a sudden I had two names going and now a third. So that's, it's messy. Um, let's talk a little bit about your latest book, The Lady Has a Past. Can you tell readers, um, just kind of give them the elevator pitch? This is the fifth book, book in my Burning Cove series, which is set in, in California during the 1930s. And I would just like to specify now that, and I say this as a librarian, uh, there are always two versions of history. One is the real version, which I think interestingly enough is always being rewritten or reassessed or re -re reinterpreted. Ever, that's an ever-changing picture of, of history. And then there is the mythic, iconic version of history. That tends to stay, be pretty immutable. And the iconic, mythic picture of Hollywood glam, California during the golden age of the movies and the studios, it really exists. That, that myth is as real as the history myth of, of, of the depression and the Dust Bowl era. I think that often happens with history. The myth stands on one side, the history, history stands on the other, and they move together into the future. It's, it's just, um, it's just the way things are, I think. Anyhow, I'm going with the, the mythic side and I'm leaning on the aura of glamor and everybody coming who came West trying to reinvent themselves. Um, the innovative things that were going on at the time, the fact that gangsters were having to move out of the old um, booze business the, into, into more, more another way to make money. They were moving into slot machines and, and casinos and things. Uh, after the after the booze became legal again. So they were, everybody was out there trying to reinvent themselves. And I have always done characters who are usually, are always in a process of trying to reinvent themselves because something's gone horribly wrong in their lives and they need to start over. So, so this kind of background, this entrepreneurial uh, reinvent yourself um, background works very well in the Hollywood studio kind of, of world where it was all make-believe anyway and in real life too. Oh, the story, <laughs> yeah, <Okay. laughs> I forgot about the story. Um, this is, for those who read the previous book, Close Up, this is the sister of the heroine in Close Up. And she has, she comes from Hollywood, or not Hollywood society, but San Francisco society. And she wants to leave her frivolous past behind and find her true calling. And she's decided she's going to be a private investigator because that's her calling. 
Three days into the job, her boss goes missing. Her boss is Raina Kirk, who other readers might remember as the private investigator of, the, the only private investigator in Burning Cove, California. And she's the lover of Luther Pell, who owns the hottest nightclub in town. So raina has gone missing and Lear is the only one who can find her. So they head off to a Palm Springs style um, spa and hotel and things take off from there. One of the things that was interesting, the, the reason I ended up in Palm Springs, a fake Palm Springs, a, a Palm Springs clune, if you will, was because I got very interested in the 30s fitness and beauty craze, which was a huge deal. And pe people were joining gyms and, and fitness clubs the same way they do today. But the, the machines, the machines looked like torture chambers. <laughs> it was, it must have been awfully hard on the body. I, I, none of it looks healthy when you see it in hindsight. But um, it makes a great setting to find a body. Put it you that actually way. Have, you have a scene in your book with kind of the, those machines and how <laughs> scary they can be. Yes, um, exactly. Now, you also created the character to kind of staff your resort, Edith Guppy. How did she come about? And I, when, in the course of the research, I ran across a biography, some biographical information about Elizabeth Arden. That's it, yeah. And talk about a marketing guru ahead of her time. I mean, she, well, we all know the name. That says it right there. And we know it because of her, not because some man took over the firm and named it after her. She created Elizabeth Arden. She created the Red Door in New York, which almost every woman in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, even today, they would know what you mean when you say the Red Door. And she was an incredible marketing genius. You could not open up a newspaper or a magazine in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and later really probably, but for sure in the 30s, you could not open up a newspaper or magazine and not come across an ad for Elizabeth Arden Cosmetics. Uh, she was just, just an, amazing, an amazing CEO. So I kind of borrowed some of that. <laughs> For my for my character of Edith Guppy, but Guppy is also in the business of reinventing herself too, because she's got a mysterious past of her own. All the women in the book have a mysterious past. That's true. Actually, I found um, Edith Guppy fascinating because, as you said, she's based on Elizabeth Arden. And just as a local note, there was a main chance spa in Phoenix. It was on the side of the Phoenician Resort, and it was. Uh -huh. Yeah, so we had all those Hollywood stars and rich and wealthy people coming here in the 30s and 40s to... Oh, oh fascinating, yeah, okay. It, it was a deal. Um, what kinds of re other research have you done when it comes to the 1930s, which is your setting, and why is that time period so fascinating to you as an author? I think I fell into the 1930s because it, it felt like the most natural fit for me and my style of writing after I left the Regency era and the 19th century in general. I had started out in the Regency originally at, in, under my Amanda name because of the, basically they were dialogue driven books. They were, they were sparkly repartee and lots of glamor and um, you know, great clothes <laughs> and, and just the whole, kind of artificial aura that, that was fun to work with. After I left the 19th century, the only place left was moving forward into the 20th century. And the, the 20s didn't feel right for me. And certainly pre-20s didn't feel right. I, don't, I couldn't even tell you why. I just knew that, that wasn't an era I wanted to go into. But as soon as my editor and I started talking about the 30s, it felt right. And I think it's I think people can get into the stories pretty quickly because on some level, they are all aware of the imagery of the 1930s. They've either seen the movies, seen the architecture, which is still all over California and New York. Um, the, it, the cars are hugely collectible from that era. Um, there's a whole noir fiction, another genre that thrives from that era and thrived from that era. 
So there's a certain familiarity to it, and it's a world that readers can step into pretty easily because of that, that cultural background. How do you kind of keep up with retaining the flavor? Do you like look at old newspapers? Do you have special museum sites that you go to? What sort of resources do you use? Yeah, the museum sites are great. And they've all gone online during the pandemic, so they're even better. <laughs> I hope they don't take them away now. Um, and the research is widely available. It's not tricky in a sense that you have to travel to the Bodleian Library or something to do it. You know, it's it's available. It's just right there in California. You know, it's it's just there. And it's it's. Um, I love the newspapers. When I'm curious about, so here's a simple example. I don't, you know, I, I wasn't really sure how, how using a telephone looked or felt in the 30s. I knew how it felt. We were still landlines when I was growing up. So I understood the landline thing and I understood the operator thing. But I wasn't sure back in the 30s if it felt the same and everything. Because that was just when the landline, that's just when the whole nation was being wired up for, for phones. So. But if you watch the old movies, you can see how they handle the phone. And you can, <laughs> you can see them asking for the operator and demanding to hear long distance and the operator saying, number please. <laughs> and it was a kind of a, a, the whole operator thing was absolutely amazing because it was from the get-go a woman's job. And it was a great woman's job. It was, it was a very good job for women and it was, it had status, it had, um, you know, everybody was, was in, I don't know, it's just, it was, it was, up, it was a good middle-class kind of job for women in those days when there weren't a whole heck of a lot of them. And that voice on the telephone line was the voice of the future. You were using a telephone, by golly, and there was a woman on the other end who was doing all the work, <laughs> doing all the tech, yeah. It was kind of cool. I love that. Stuff like that. And, and little things come along that either we've forgotten about because they we've left them so far behind or we never, younger generation never even knew. Like when you check, check into a hotel room, they would reach behind the, the desk and take a key down off the wall and hand you the key. And so when the detective walks through and he's trying to see if somebody's in that room, all he has to do is look at the board on the back behind the front desk and the key is missing. That means whoever is in that room has the key. Therefore, there's somebody in the room. Little things like that that are helpful in the, in the core plot of the, of the nuts and bolts of the plot. I enjoy. Let's talk a little bit about author's voice. Um, for many of us as a reader, we either connect with the book or we don't based on how the writer is telling the story, their voice. Um, talk to us about your own literary voice, how you would describe it to someone. Voice, as you know, you, you, you've been reviewing books, you've talked to a lot of authors, you've been to a lot of conferences and stuff. You know how hard it is to explain or define a voice. Sometimes I think it's easier for me to define my voice by what it isn't. Okay. So for example, I'm, I'm a huge fan, thanks to this, this uh, particular bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona called The Poison Pen, <laughs> which has been sending me boxes of what, what, what technically we now call psychological suspense, but for the rest of us is just the new Gothic. Okay. I love this stuff, but I could not write it in a million years. It is, it would not fit my voice or my, I couldn't make my voice fit that kind of, I love it, but I can't write it. And it's partly because often, it, well, it's truly narrative driven. Description is a huge, a huge part of the Gothic novel setting that atmosphere. And I suck at narratives. <laughs> there you go. There's another, another genre out the tubes for you. Um, so, so I would say that my voice is not, it's dialogue driven, it's not narrative. I don't really get going in a story until my characters start talking to each other. That's, I, so I guess you would say I hear the story in my head before I see it. 
and that's how I that's how I actually write a story. I tend to write light because I don't have a, a voice that fits the darker atmospheric stories. Um, and it's, there's too much humor in the books. It wouldn't it would it would jar the reader out of the story if I were trying to inject that into a a dark atmospheric story. The humor would ruin it. So I have a, a voice that is optimistic. I basically that just reflects me. I'm fundamentally free. Some would say to to a to a fall. <laughs> um, I have a voice that is truly at home in, in popular culture, in the sense that I love the old archetypes. I love, um, you know, concepts of honor matter in popular fiction. Um, courage matters. Grit, determination matters. Uh, a belief in the healing power of love matters. And in the end, doing the right thing thing matters. Those are really fundamental to our to popular fiction in our culture. And you as a writer, you violate those at your own peril because readers are coming, I think, to popular fiction to reaffirm those really core and very ancient values. So um, I would say that's part of my voice too. But, but it's really hard to define. <laughs> and it's, it's the same way with other writers. It, it's um, it has something to do, I think, also with the themes that you're called to write that you go back to and return to again and again. Would that be your core story that you're talking about? Yeah, I think every author has one. You've heard me say that before. Um, I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I still, I haven't seen anything to go against that theory. And it has to do with the themes and the conflicts and the emotions that you feel compelled to keep re-exploring and I think authors do it for their whole of their career. Now you're going to ask me what, <laughs> what are my, okay. Yeah, um, you got it. <laughs> the themes, I, that's easier for me actually to explain because I, I, I can see them fairly clearly in my writing. My books always explore the risks of trust, primarily trusting other people, which I think is the biggest risk we all take and we all take it every day of our lives to some extent. And there's a huge risk factor involved in that. So I, I play off that one way or another. And in addition to the, um, to the core story, my characters, as I mentioned earlier, are always in the process of reinventing themselves and opening a new door in their lives, finding their way. And that's certainly true in this book where everybody is looking for a new path forward. Um, you've talked about core stories and voice. Um, let's talk a little bit about literary critics and popular fiction. And you've been known to say that you think sometimes some literary critics miss the boat when it comes to popular fiction. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? I think the key to reviewing popular fiction, and you're a perfect example because you do it right, at least in my opinion. <laughs> no, you do it right because you have a fundamental understanding of the genre that you're reviewing and critiquing, and you have a sense of what works and what doesn't work, and you respond to it yourself. It, so I think that's the, 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 the most important thing for a critic to have is, a, is an intuitive, to, to resonate somewhat with, with the genre. I don't think you can really critique it without that. I think you can critique other things without, res you know, without a personal response to them. But when it comes to popular fiction, it's probably best to stay in your own lane. It's probably best to, to you understand intuitively the conventions of that genre. You understand um, what works and what doesn't, what readers really want. And most of all, you understand why it works. And that's the key to being able to critique that genre. Otherwise, it, it just, it, all you see is the surface and you miss it. You miss everything underneath. You've been quoted as saying you have a compulsion to write. That's why you're a writer. 
um, what is your process like? I'm especially interested because you do these kind of mystery suspense elements to your stories. And usually with that, you have to kind of know who did it, how it was done, all that. Do you know in advance? Is it more of a write as you go? Talk about the process of writing for you. Sadly, I am not a good plotter. So, <laughs> um, I, even if I try to outline a plot ahead of time, it'll, it all goes out the window by chapter three. It just, it just does. I've tried it, believe me, I've tried it. It would be really nice to get up every morning and know exactly what I'm going in the book that day. But that, that's just gone until I get to the very end and I do know where I'm going. I, and the reason I'm, I'm a pantser, as we say in the business, I write by the seat of my pants. And the reason I write that way, I think it's just fundamentally because if I do it the other way, I get bored with the story. I have already told the story to myself. And I, I write these books first for myself. I'm telling the story to me and hoping like heck that, that readers can join me in the fantasy. Um, I don't think that's uncommon. I think a lot of writers do it that way. It's, you know, if a book is working for you and that's really all you can know. And that is your gut telling you, this is the story I want to hear right now or tell myself right now. And if, it, if you're not hearing that feeling, you're probably going down a wrong path in the books. So, so the basic process is I'm, a, I'm mostly a um, morning person. That's you know, it's just that fundamental morning person. So it's coffee in the mornings and writing until um, till around noon or so. And then research and figuring out where I am going to go next or trying to figure out where I'm going to go next in the, in the afternoons. That's that on a practical basis. But that varies too, because at the end of a book where you do know you're where you're going, there's just this kind of mad, mad rush to get it all down while it's still, while you can finally see the, what, what for me, it's a mad rush to get down because I can finally see the whole book. I can finally see the whole story and I have the vision of the story. So that's the best time for me. Uh, the Lady Has a Past is part of your Burning Cove series. As an author, what are the advantages to writing books that have a connection, whether it's setting or characters? And are there any disadvantages, at least for you? I learned early on that I was never going to be able to sustain a series with two continuing main characters as the co-stars, so to speak, going forward indefinitely. I always liked the man-woman team of sleuths, but I need a new set, a new, a new couple with each book. And the problem is that by the end of the first book, I have solved all their problems. I have left them in a good place and I don't wanna to have to go back two, three, four, five, 20 books later and come up with new problems for them. It just, I'd rather start fresh with a new couple and, and a fresh set of problems. So it's, it's, not, it's not a way I've been able to build a career. But the fallback is create a town and then bring people into the town. And that's what I've done with Burning Cove. That works. Or, or a group like um, the Arkeen Society, which is a, um, a, a, a group of people that, that all have an interest in the psychic vibe thing. And that's, I write those under my Jane and Crin's names and under occasionally under Amanda Quick names too. And I, I, my editor pointed out the other day that what I've really done is created a Jane verse. <laughs> Jane <laughs> um, and, and it's a universe in which I'm, got main characters going or, or main stories, contemporary stories going in one corner, futuristic stories going in another corner. And now the historical stories going in the third corner. And at times they overlap a bit. Things from one world influence the other and, or artifacts show up from one book to another. But you don't need to know that to enjoy the stories because every book I write now stands alone. Mostly because I can't figure out how to do the continuing characters. So there you are. <laughs> well, I think it's tough because you write uh, romantic suspense. And in the romance genre, the couple needs to be together, at least happily for that moment in time at the end of the book. So it would be hard to do a, a continuing character in that genre. Yeah, that's. 
you could set up a, I mean, it's certainly been done with successfully with a husband and wife team of sleuths. Yeah. And that's very doable, but you need to inject some problem into the couple's life, every book. It isn't just them solving the crime. You need their story is what is key to the crime solving. And, and it, for me, it works in lockstep. Every, every twist in the crime has to impact the relationship and vice versa. And that's what I don't think I could do for too many books in a row with the same couple. So. Um, looking back on your distinguished writing career, um, we have people tuning in who are aspiring writers themselves. What have you learned as a writer that you would tell them who are just starting out? What advice would you give them? Find a group of writers who are doing what you're doing. Find your tribe, find your people, find, um, figure out where, where you can meet up with other people who share your passion for writing. And if you're looking, and the best way to do that, I think, is with a good, solid writer's organization. There are a lot of them out there. And a lot of them have gone online during the pandemic. So you can now join them. You don't have to live in the same town as the organization, which is very useful. And if you're looking for those kinds of groups, one of the best places to do is contact your local library. They'll know who's working local and they'll be able to connect you if there's people if there's groups working nationally that would suit you so check the library and find a writer's group because you're going to learn more in six months that way about the business and the craft than i did in years working working alone without any outside connections into that world I've often found that many authors are also readers. That's a big part of why they become authors. So I'd like to have you talk to us a little bit about what have you been reading recently that you have enjoyed and want to share with other readers? Well, I mentioned earlier that thanks to you <laughs> turning me <laughs> on to it, I have really become fascinated with this uh, new, new version of the Gothic, which is how I think of it, this psychological suspense. It's, it's just a reinvention of a fabulous genre that we haven't seen for a while. I, I, I say that actually, it's been going pretty hot now for what, a couple of years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'm just coming late to it. So I didn't realize how, how much it was, how much it was growing. But um, a good starter book in the, in the sense that it, it's a very well done uh, version of it and it feels right, it feels modern. It feels, feels like the right reinvention of the book would be J.T. Ellison's Her Dark Lies. And J.T. Ellison has a real gift for the kind of atmosphere and the kind of action that make, the atmosphere was always in the, in the Gothic novel, but the modern version has a lot more action and more, more suspense in the sense of modern suspense. And J.T. Ellison uh, does it very well, the combination very well. Another interesting version of that, I think you enjoyed this one too. I think you mentioned um, is um, Silvia Moreno Garcia's Mexican Gothic. And the reason that book is interesting is because it actually takes the step into horror. She, she walks a fine line there. And so it, le it takes the Gothic, which originally was about horror. It, in a, it was a, a horror novel takes it beyond the ghost thing and into, into horror, but it's very plausibly done horror and it really worked for me. So that would be, that would be if you're interested in this new kind of Gothic, I think those are two starting points, but thanks to my recent shipment from Poison Pen, and I haven't read these yet, but I'm looking at, the girls are all so nice here by yeah. Laurie Elizabeth Flynn mm -hmm. and Jennifer McMahon's The Drowning Kind. I'm looking forward to trying, so. I think there was another book that you've been kind of raving about too by someone who might share the same last name as you. <laughs> uh, this is this is the PSA, public service announcement for my, uh, my 
my husband's cousin, actually, Mike J. Krentz, who is writing medical thrillers. And his latest is Dead Already. And it's a really good medical thriller. And that's another genre that feels like it's kind of time to get hot again. It's, it's always been there in the background, it's, but it ebbs and flows like all of them. And right now it feels like it's been out of the, out of the mainstream for a while, but starting to, the time has come to fire it back up. So. Especially with all the concern about the pandemic and health and things like that. Yeah, it could be very uh, timely. Hope, hope so for him. <laughs> um, now let's talk a little bit about the future and what's coming up. Uh, rumor has it that we may see some dust bunnies. <laughs> the dust bunnies. This, <laughs> this is, I keep saying this is going to be on my tombstone. <laughs> she wrote the dust bunny books. <laughs> other, other people will have cat books or dog books, but I'm going to be the dust bunny. Um, yes, and those are the books I am writing under my Jane Castle name, The Futuristics. And for those of you who have never heard of Dust Bunnies, or at least not the kind that actually have psychic powers, um, they're the, they're, li they're little critters. They're like the, they're like the ideal pet you always wanted, the, the perfect cross between a cat and a dog and, and a parakeet or something. <laughs> um, and just just smart. And they, uh, they have literally taken over my Jane Castle world. <laughs> Nobody reads my books anymore for my, my brilliant plots or my, my in-depth characterizations or my clever, my clever science fiction landscape. It's just more dust bunnies. Give me the dust bunnies and forget, forget the hero and heroine. <laughs> it, but to answer your question, the book is called Guild Boss and it comes out in November. November. Um, and this is just a commercial message from our side. We do have the book available for pre-orders at the Poison Pen. So feel free to order The Guild Boss by Jane Castle through us. And we would love to help support uh, Jane that way. Um, that's coming in November. What about your next Krentz book? Can you tell us anything or do you want to tell us anything about that? Yeah, actually, because after November comes December and then January, which, <laughs> which is Yes, the next Krenz book. I can't believe we're moving forward through this year so fast. Yeah. But the next one in January is the final book in the Fog Lake trilogy, which is my trilogy mm -hmm. um, involving a old mid-20th mid mid century um, paranormal lab with running exotic experiments and the experiments went bad, of course, right? terrible things happened. So the government tried to bury it. Everybody involved with it was just either disappeared or literally buried. <laughs> the whole thing was hushed up. But now the secrets from the past are coming out and spilling down into the future. And a lot of the people who were uh, affected by the experiments, their descendants are now stuck cleaning up the mess. And that's your January Krenz book? Yep. It's called um, Lightning in a Mirror. Oh. Yeah, I had to stop and think of that title because it's not like my usual titles. It's kind of, kind of different. So. That's actually an interesting segue. Um, how much control do you have over titles? Are you good at titling your own books? What is involved in titling a Jane M. Krenz book? <laughs> Once in a while, titles just pop out. The Lady Has a Past was a title that it, it kind of just popped out because it, it, fit all the it fit all the female characters. It had a 1930s movie Hitchcockian sort of ring Hi. to it. Yeah. it. It just fit. And sometimes you get lucky and that's what happens. Um, other times you and your editor go over and over and over <laughs> try, trying to make a decision. Because the title should do a couple of things. It, it, it doesn't, shouldn't just grab attention. It should be like a little verbal snapshot of the book. It, it should send the message of something key about the book. The same way, it has the same job as the cover. Not just get your attention, but send some kind of a, of a psychic message that this is a book you want to read. And, and here's why. 
And you take the same care with your characters' names as you do titles. They're very important to you. Talk to us a little bit about how you come up with names for characters. I, I am the, I am desperate for new names. <laughs> if anybody out there, if you have an unusual name, please send it to me. Come on my Facebook page and tell me about it. Names after so many books are a very difficult thing for me because like the title, they have to fit the character. And that's just, that doesn't happen just instantly. It's, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten halfway through a book and realized the character has the wrong name. And the other thing that happens to me with names is I tend to, I've written a lot of books, John. And <laughs> they go back a while. And there, there aren't that many names I love. So I have been known to accidentally reuse names. Oh. The, best thing, the best thing that ever happened to me for names was when I invented the, the Jones family for the, for the <laughs> Arcane Society books, because then all I had to do is name all the heroes, the last names were already in Jones, they're all gonna be Jones. <laughs> I need another brilliant idea like that. Now I have a question because it fascinated me when I discovered this. I know people have been doing a lot of different things during the pandemic to cope with um, the stress and things like that. And I discovered you have a new passion in the form of boxing. What, how exactly did this happen? I mean, you're not what I would picture as a boxing kind of person. Well, unfortunately, the boxing thing did not last. It was fun while it lasted. But I, I discovered it while on a cruise with my husband. And it was one of the um, things, you know, off, it was one of the offerings from the spa, from the, from the fitness side of the, of the ship. And there was an opportunity to book X number of one-on-one -on -one classes for boxing. And I just thought it sounded like something, you know, you just give it a whirl. And I loved it. <laughs> it was just like, somehow when I put those big gloves on and I could hit anything I wanted as hard as I wanted and it didn't hurt my hand and nobody was getting hurt. I wasn't hitting like a person. I could just, I don't know, it was like this great release. I, I highly recommend it. Um, but when I got back to Seattle, I wasn't able to continue with it. So, so sadly, it was, it was limited to a, a, a cruise, but I highly recommend giving it a shot. It's, it's, um, it's just, it was exhilarating to tell you the truth. It was, it was violence without a real threat. It was, it was, Letting go, it, I think what it did is it made me realize how as human beings, we are always on some level in control. We're always maintaining control. That's part of who we, what we are. And we're always shocked by people who lose control. That's always a very unpleasant experience all the way around and everybody is horrified usually. But the boxing is a way of doing it without risk without any bad feedback. And so after a while, it just kind of <laughs> feels good. That's all I can tell you. Um, we do have some questions from your Facebook fans. So the first one is, if you could meet any author, dead or alive, who would you choose? Nancy Drew, but she's not an author. So I guess that doesn't count. <laughs> she was my formative, my formative reading material. Um, I would like to have known, but she was gone, been gone a long time. Um, I, I would like to have met, uh, Anne McCaffrey because it was her book, Restore Read, that I discovered it back in, when I was a teenager that opened the possibilities of writing my story to me. Now she didn't write any, that was, it was a futuristic romance, that futuristic romantic suspense that you would easily identify it today. But at the time, she had to be the only one doing it. She had to, and, it, and she got out of it real fast. So I'm sure it didn't work well for her. And then she moved on to Dragons, which was a smart career move. But Restore probably did, was the one book that got me into thinking about writing my own book because I wanted more like that. So Anne McCaffrey, best in peace. Um, I wish we'd met, but thank you for the reading. Uh, do you write? Well, I think we've 
covered this, but you can address it again. Do you write an outline? I think you said that you. No, I, I, I was, I, when I start a book, I usually know where I'm going for the first three chapters. And then I use those first three chapters to figure out my characters. That's where I learn where the characters, who they are, and that makes it possible to keep moving forward. But it's a very lurchy, <laughs> a lurching along kind of process. Um, this one I think you've also talked about, but you can readdress a little bit perhaps. Did you know a lot about the 1930s as a historical setting before you started writing these books? Was that a particular interest of yours? No, it wasn't, um, but I had seen a lot of the movies. Huh. And so I had an image and that's also how I knew that was the, the mythic side of the thirties that I wanted to pursue in, when I started writing it. And my image of the thirties from the movies is that repartee, that snappy dialogue, that fast, just clever writing and, and storytelling and lots of action and great clothes great cars. <laughs> what drew me to the 30s was very similar to what drew me to the, uh, the Regency. The glamour, the length, the, and the dialogue. The, 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 right, the With. conversational repartee. Um, is there any chance that at some point in time you might write your own cookbook featuring your recipes? <laughs> no, because I'll tell you why. I, <laughs> Occasionally I post a recipe or try to post a recipe on my Facebook page because somebody will say, could, could we have the recipe for whatever? Um, and the answer is it's really hard to write recipes. Oh my gosh. It's like, is it a quarter teaspoon or a half teaspoon? Is it a, <laughs> it's because I don't cook that way. I don't cook. That's it. I just kind of throw things together. And when I sit down and try to do it, it's, very difficult writing. And then I think, what if I screw this up and somebody puts a tablespoon of salt instead of a teaspoon of salt, in, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, so sadly, I don't think cookbooks are in my future. Maybe if the bottom falls out of the future is fixed. <laughs> <laughs> um, this next question, I have my suspicions about who sent it in, but the question is, Rumor has it, you have said that Susan Elizabeth Phillips' next book coming in June, When Stars Collide, is the best thing you've ever read. <laughs> you think maybe we can take a wild guess about <laughs> who said that question? In? Well, it's a really interesting question because like the book is not out yet. So I could. <laughs> However, true. When Stars Collide comes out, I will definitely be reading it and I will be definitely saying it's the best book I ever read today. Well, I, was, I was fortunate enough to get a, an advanced look at the book so I can tell you that it is a terrific book and Susan does do kind of a flirtation with the suspense so maybe she's moving into your territory. <laughs> that would be Susan. Come <laughs> you might have to pick, pick up the boxing gloves again Jane and tell her to stay in her lane. Um, but yeah, Susan's new book is When Stars Collide. It comes out in June, so definitely think about that one. Um, the last question I have from Facebook is, has the recent year or so that we've experienced the pandemic changed the way you write? I think it's probably done more to push my writing all over the, the day. Uh, you know, I, I used to be, everything I did creatively was in the mornings and then in the afternoons I'm Go to Nordstrom, go go grocery shopping, take a walk, I, you know, things like that. But when the afternoon suddenly closed down, uh, the writing seemed to expand to fill the day available. <laughs> I don't know how that works. but Is that why we got a Jane Council book this year? Yeah, I had the time, yeah. Hmm. Uh, before we go ahead and close, we do have some special raffle gifts that are going out to some of the people that purchased uh lady has that passed from the poison pen so jane if you could give me um 10 numbers between 1 and 50 and those people on our list will receive one of the raffle items well number one number, number one. one should definitely be there okay and 12 12 okay and then 13 13 
And 17. 17. 20. 20. 30. 30. 33. Okay. How long, how many more have I got? You've got two more. Um, 40 okay. and, and 48. 48. So those um, people who purchase books with those numbers on our list will get something additional, probably by separate mail, because we haven't figured out how to package them um, with the books. Um, but before I uh, extend my thanks to Jane, I do want to say we do have a very small number left of signed copies of Lady Has a Past. So if you're interested in a signed copy by uh, Jane writing as Amanda, contact the Poison Pen ASAP because they are going fast. Um, and with that commercial message aside, I want to thank Jane and her alter ego, Amanda, for joining us today, for writing such terrific books, and for always being such a strong supporter of the book world. Thank you, Jane. Thank you for having me. This is always a pleasure. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.